Welcome to Bible 360, 2 Timothy. Paul writes a heartfelt letter to Timothy, whom the old bachelor refers to as his son in Christ. Perhaps this has something to do with the fact that while we hear about the faith of both Timothy's mother and grandmother, Eunice and Lois, there's no indication about the faith, if any, of Timothy's father. What is definitely clear is that Timothy and Paul not only had a great working relationship, but cared deeply for one another. Paul brought Timothy along and mentored him, and he rejoiced at Timothy's successes. Paul writes Timothy as he is, again in prison, and the content and the tone of Paul's letter indicates that he thinks he is awaiting his death. Whether or not he actually dies or is released, we're not really sure which it is, Paul writes as if these are his dying wishes, perhaps even his last will and testament. Paul had very few personal possessions that belonged to him, although he does ask that Timothy bring two essential items along. First, Paul will need his cloak because he probably otherwise would grow gravely ill and perhaps die in the unforgiving and ill-accommodated Roman prison he is in. He also asks for his scrolls and parchments, which are his last way to communicate with the churches and the weapon by which he can advance the gospel in the coming kingdom of God. Paul has not despaired or quit, despite the terribly depressing circumstances he's in. Far more important to Paul than his possessions is that the gospel continues to be preached, and the word of the Lord spreads, whether he is alive or executed. His best bet to see this accomplished is to urge leaders like Timothy and others to be faithful preachers of the gospel and leaders of the church. He puts most of the rest of this heartfelt letter into urging and strategizing towards that aim. Paul remembers Timothy and prays for him, looking forward to seeing him. One of Paul's main messages towards Timothy is a message of encouragement. Paul knows that his name is controversial, and many people think he is dangerous, others foolhardy, others simply see him as a criminal. But he urges Timothy not to be ashamed either of Paul or, more importantly, of his gospel message. Rather than backing down, God's people are not to be timid, but bold, discipled, and full of the power and love of Christ. Paul trusts in the lordship of his Lord Jesus Christ and knows that Jesus is directing things so that God's will is being done and God's plans are being carried out, even if Paul is in prison. In addition to being bold, Paul tells Timothy to be focused and disciplined. He's to consider himself a soldier or a professional athlete, focused and driven to excel in sharing the gospel. Paul is not the least bit reformed from the activity that caused his imprisonment. Now that he can't be out there causing a ruckus with the gospel, he's dead set on strengthening Timothy to do so in his absence. Paul might be in chains, but the gospel is free as a bird. But aware that what has happened to him might hamper than Timothy, Paul warns Timothy to not just teach and preach, but to mentor and to train other leaders, men who are capable teachers. However, these men must not be quarrelsome. The point is not to be obsessed with words or arguments, but obsessed with the message of Jesus and living out of the gospel. Those who aspire to lead should be gentle, patient enough to lead people to the truth. God will work through both good and evil, lazy and hardworking to accomplish his will in this world. Timothy, though, is not to waste his energy and focus on the evil desires of youth. Instead, his energy and focus should be towards a higher purposes of faith, love, righteousness, and peace. There certainly will be opposition, though. Don't expect things to get better or easier, Paul tells Timothy. It's the opposite. Things are going to get worse. So beware of false teachers, those who deceitfully mislead people down wicked paths. But Paul appeals to Timothy to remember Paul's own life and ministry. Paul preaching good things, faith, patience, love, and endurance in the face of suffering. Paul faced suffering for doing good, but the Lord delivered him out of all his troubles. The insinuation is God will deliver Timothy even if he faces hardships, enemies, or persecution. Don't get knocked off your course. Remember the way of Jesus. And by all means, hold on to the scriptures because these prepared you for Jesus' coming and they continue to be helpful for God's people, teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. By learning from the scriptures, God's people will be prepared to do good in this world. Paul calls God as his witness as he wants Timothy to swear that he will continue to preach the word, to teach, to rebuke, and to instruct God's people. Undoubtedly, people will come teaching prosperity, pleasure, and whatever else men desire, and they will ignore God's instructions and guidance. But you keep your head above water and stay the course. Paul doesn't envision or plan getting out. In fact, 
He describes his current state as a sacrifice. His life is being poured out. He has no regrets about his ministry. He has fought the good fight. He has kept the faith. Dying in the service of the gospel is exactly the way Paul would want to go out. Nonetheless, he does expect to be vindicated by the Lord. His life is not a waste. So he certainly also remembers those who stood by him, like the family of Onesiphorus. He also remembers the many who deserted him. Although he's not vindictive, he asked the Lord to forgive those who were less loyal. He does warn Timothy to be on his guard against Alexander, who actively opposed Paul in Ephesus and is likely to oppose Timothy as well. Paul sends his love and personal greeting to some of his friends and biggest supporters, and he sends Timothy greetings from some of those who have already visited Paul. Thus, Paul closes his letter and perhaps his ministry in life. No regrets, gospel at the center, and encouraging others to fight the good fight and keep the faith.